Ronan, could you help me light the chalice this morning? Thank you. We kindle this symbol of our community of faith for the light of truth, the warmth of love, and the fire of commitment. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Greater Lansing. My name is Reverend Neil Anderson. I serve this religious community as senior minister, and I use the pronouns he and him. What a joy, as it is always, to gather together this Sunday morning. Um, after worship, you are all invited to stay for lunch. Uh, I noticed a, a few of the youth uh, at the back of the sanctuary this morning, maybe taking a break from preparing the cornbread um, that indeed is gluten-free. Uh, the soup is on, and there are vegan and vegetarian options for you uh, to, um, to enjoy. So after worship, you can go into uh, the social hall and there'll be a, a lineup there for soup. I, you know, I just remember there's even salad. There's even salad. Uh, and um, the youth, um, uh, as they say in Unitarian Universalist youth parlance, were locked in last night right here uh, at UU Lansing. So they spent the evening and part of that uh, the fun and frivolity was creating, uh, ha having a super evening, creating soup, um, and then staying up all night. So um, I imagine naps are probably uh, in, in the offing later today. Um, they invite you to give a, 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 um, uh, to to make a free will offering uh, for soup if you can. Um, this is their contribution uh, to the fundraising for the auction uh, and for um, the congregation's budget. Uh, so um, they were, uh, the youth were happy to be engaged in that. And speaking of the auction, you may have noticed uh, that when you arrived this morning, there were plenty of tables out 
in the atrium full of sheets of paper awaiting your bidding number and your name and the amount of money that you wish to bid on numerous items and everyone here is welcome to participate here this morning if you've joined us via live stream um, you will be able to participate tomorrow at 6 p.m. Uh, there is a link on our website for all the information about the auction and if you go to that link you there'll be a link uh, on the next page for the catalog page where in fact you can make a bid if you have any questions or um, need some technical support there is an email address for the auction team which is also on that website uh, on that uh, on our website so uh, we would love for you all to participate in this fabulous fundraiser uh, take a browse around there are objects that you can bid on and also opportunities oh look at that I love this um, uh, Mary Elaine reminded me that um, those who have great information about the auction have things on that say ask me brilliant <laughs> how do I get my bidder number Mary Elaine so I just have to go to the information table. Look at how that works. That's fantastic. Oh, let's see. So we've done the auction. We've done stay for soup. Uh, we have welcome to everybody here. Let's see. Um, I think that was it for what we wanted to accomplish in the welcome this morning. Uh, the last thing that I want to accomplish, though, is for everybody to take a few moments to let each other know what a blessing it is to be together on a Sunday morning, to witness to each other's lives, to share in these moments of shaping what is of worth to us as a religious community. Before we do that, welcome all of you uh, who join us via live stream this morning. It is good to have you with us. Um, might include um, our uh, our... Um, come on, Neil. Our, our Director of Music and Worship Arts, LB, who was unable to be with us this morning as he had planned because he has a viral infection um, that he didn't want to uh, share with you all. Um, so that means the choir won't sing this morning um, like we had, but hopefully LB will be feeling better soon. Uh, Mary Elaine will be leading our songs as, uh, as you saw. So let us take a moment to greet one another.
it in our order. So gecko first, please. And then fire, fireflies, thumbs right. Woodpecker over here. You're gonna hold the microphone first. Fireflies. The next <coughs> mix. And then you sing off the bed to me. And Zuzu over here. Perfect. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, you can hear me. <laughs> okay. We um we are gonna present to you a a tellable tale called the Grumpy Gecko. Uh, we are going to need someone to play the role of Tiger. Any volunteers? Oh, yes, come over here, please, Tiger. Okay, in this story, the tiger is going to um, be meeting several animals and, and learning about how we all need each other, especially this coming Earth Day. Okay, tiger? Okay. And, all right. In a shady glade, the chief of the jungle slept until gecko, gecko, gecko. Tiger woke up with a snort. He opened one yellow eye. Gecko, he growled, what do you want? It's the middle of the night. I've come to complain. <laughs> what could Gecko the lizard have to complain about? He spent most of his time lazing around, just sleeping and eating. Even when he was hungry, all he had to do was flick out his sticky tongue and lick up a mosquito. What's troubling you, Tiger asked. It's the fireflies, said Gecko. All night long, they fly around, flish, flashing their lights in my eyes, keeping me awake, gashing, shaking. I haven't slept for days. It's making me very grumpy. Did the chief of the jungle make them stop? Tiger stifled a gigantic yawn. I'll talk to the fireflies, he promised Gecko. Tiger sighed and set off to find the fireflies. Max, can you get the microphone to play now? Thank you. Wading through wet paddy fields, the night vibrated with the chirps and croaks of frogs and the trills of a million insects. Above the paddies, the fireflies flickered and flashed. Fireflies, Tiger called. Gecko says you have been disturbing his sleep, flashing and flickering all night long. Is this true? Well, we do flash our lights all night, replied the fireflies. We don't want to disturb anyone. We're just passing on the woodpecker's message. We heard him drumming out a warning. I see, said Tiger. Then I'll talk to woodpecker. At the edge of the paddies, Tiger found Woodpecker drumming against a coconut palm. Rat-a-tat, rat-a-tat, rat-a-tat. Woodpecker, Tiger winced. The fireflies say you've been rapping and tapping and tapping and rapping and drumming out a warning. Is that true? Of course. I provide a great service. Clearly, my efforts are not appreciated. Beetle rolls manure right across the path. I warn the jungle animals so that no one steps in it. Without my drumming, who knows what a mess you'd all be in. Oh, said Tiger. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you. Tiger licked his nose thoughtfully. <laughs> I'll go speak to Beetle. It was easy to spot Beetle on the jungle path. In the moonlight, his back gleamed like polished metal. What's all this, Tiger asked. Woodpecker says you're rolling filthy mess all over the place. Yes, yes, can't stop. Water buffalo drops piles all over, all of it, all over the path. If if I don't move some from it away, there'll be muck everywhere. Excuse me. Tiger lifted his paw, and Beetle bus bustled past. Okay, said Tiger, suppressing a sigh. Thank you, Beetle. I'll go and see Buffalo. Tiger found Buffalo asleep in a pool of mud. Buffalo, Tiger roared. Beetle says you've been leaving your manure all over the path. Is this true? Oh, yes, sir, said Buffalo, lowering his head. 
I'll leave manure all over the path, sir. But you see, sir, it's helpful, sir. Rain washes holes in the path every afternoon. I'll leave manure only to fill up the holes so that no one trips or falls. If I didn't, sir, someone could get hurt. I see, said Tiger. Well, that's very thoughtful of you, Buffalo. Tiger's tail twitched. He was beginning to lose patience. He sighed, I'll go ahead and hear what rain has to say. Tiger set off for Mount Agung, the highest peak on the island and the home of rain. Tiger climbed and he climbed and he climbed. He climbed through the jungle, woodland and scrub, and then he climbed some more. At last, his claws clattered onto the smooth grass of the mountain peak. He stopped to catch his breath. He looked down the mountain. The sun was rising. Tiger stared. Jungle spread out for miles around, flamboyant with flowers, wild orchids and climbing lilies, trumpets of violet blue and starbursts of brilliant flame red. Tiger sniffed. He smelt jasmine, lang lang, frangy panty. He swiveled his ears. He heard newborn streams trickling and tinkling. And below the jungle, on the green gold steps of the paddy fields, he could just make out the faint flicker and flash of the fireflies. No need to ask why rain rains, Tiger smiled. He cooled his paws in a stream and watched for a while. He watched the water journey from mountain to sea, sustaining every living thing on its way, even the tiniest mosquito. Tiger plunged his muzzle into the clear, fresh water and drank. <laughs> then he began the long journey down the mountain and through the forests and jungles and paddies to find Gecko. It was dusk by the time Tiger found the lizard again. Oh, yeah, Gecko needs his microphone back. Do you have it? Oh. Oh, wait. Well, Gecko's muted. Did you talk to the fireflies? They're still flashing and flickering on and on. Did you tell them to stop? Gecko, said Tiger. He sat down on his haunches and spoke very slowly. Listen carefully. The fireflies flashed to pass on Woodpecker's warning. Woodpecker warns everyone not to step in Beetle's dung. Beetle clears up the excess dung left by Buffalo. Buffalo leaves manure on the path to fill up the holes made by rain. Rain makes holes in the path as he creates streams and lakes and puddles, puddles where mosquitoes live. Gecko, what do you eat? Mosquitoes. So. So repeated Gecko slowly. Yes. If rain stopped raining. Yes. Buffalo would, could stop filling holes. Uh huh. Uh, uh huh. And beetle could stop rolling dung. Yes. And woodpecker could stop drumming. Mm. And the fireflies could stop flashing. Yes, gecko. But I would have nothing to eat. Exactly, said Tiger. Gecko, everything in this world is connected. Go and live in peace with the fireflies. So Gecko stuck himself upside down underneath the branch of a tree. He closed his eyes. He went to sleep. The fireflies flickered and flashed. Tiger snored. Mm. Thank you.
morning, everyone. My name is Alessandra Ganim Red. My pronouns are she, they, and I'm your worship associate this morning. When I heard that Neil was going to be giving a sermon entitled Belong to Your Place this month, I realized it was a great opportunity for me to reflect on, well, where I've been. Like Neil, I'm not originally from Lansing. I grew up about an hour and a half east of here in Dearborn. Then my family moved to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and then I moved back to go to school at Albion. And then I would drive back to Dearborn to live with my grandparents during breaks, and then I would drive back to Albion, and then I had met my, then, or eventually my spouse, who then went to Michigan State. <laughs> we graduated and we moved to Howell, so I could commute to Ypsilanti. <laughs> and then we moved back here to live in an apartment. <laughs> And then we were one of those lucky people who bought a house in 2019 just before the pandemic started. <sighs> I've moved around a lot. <laughs> and this is the longest I've lived in one place in the last 15 years. And this is important to me for many reasons, but one is that I follow a nature-based spiritual path. And part of my path has been to understand the land I live on. Every time I've moved, I've had to start somewhat from scratch to get to know where I'm living. And more than just the people, the animals, the spirits, and the land in which all of us are living on, so we can try to ideally work together in harmony. Every place has a feeling, and it's difficult to describe succinctly, even within the same area. But I'm going to do my best to start with the easiest. The land of the house we lived in in Gettysburg was built where Pickett's Charge happened. I'd bicycle from there through the battlefields and up to Little Round Top and look out over the battlefields to watch the sun start to set over the Appalachian Mountains. The land held the blood of those who had died from war in stark contrast and juxtaposition with the natural beauty that had healed around and with it. Albion had a beautiful forest that usually smelled faintly of weed that, for the record, was not mine. <laughs> Seriously. But also, on the other side were the forks in the Kalamazoo River. It thrummed with a quiet strength of survival. Howell <laughs> held complicated feelings of covered up racial pain mixed with suburbanization of a rural town and a quiet, ill-eased, pieced forest, which is something Dearborn also has, but it also has the joy of a cement-lined segment of the Rouge River to control the water flow, and the glow of the factories would stain the night's clouds a strange red hue, but there was also the forests around Henry Ford's home and around the U of M campus that teemed with abundant life. They've all been so full of contradictions. When we first moved back to Lansing, I was admittedly a little tired of making relationships only to move 18 months later. It's hard when you get to know everybody and you make a lot of friends and then you have to say goodbye so quickly. I was caught up in a sense of nihilism that was unfortunate, but six months passed, and then 12 months passed, and then two years passed, and I started to cautiously settle into the idea that this was home now. It will be eight years this summer that I get to say that, and I have to say that I'm quite happy to be able to. Of all the places I've lived, this has been the most wonderful and painful and charming and confusing place. <laughs> and I mean that with all the love in my heart. I don't know if you know this, but there's a bridge not far from here that routinely gets hit by a truck <laughs> and seems to be roughly fine. <laughs> we live in a city, but for, the most, but for most of town, before they started doing all the construction work, you could drive like 10, 15 minutes and be in roughly the middle of nowhere, even within the mailing address of Lansing. Speaking of which, I still don't know entirely where I live. <laughs> because the house we bought is in a village, in an unincorporated census district, in a township, in a completely different county than the city whose mailing address gets written on the envelope. <laughs> but also I've stopped trying to figure it out. <laughs> The river has long washed away any concern I had about settling here and trying to find community with you guys. Though apparently, how I call a sliding glass door a door wall is a dead giveaway that no, I was not always from here, but for better or worse, I am now. So come, come from wherever your travels have taken you, for we are all here now, 
and let us worship together. Do any of you have regular things that you do every day or every week or every month? Something that you might look forward to? I was thinking uh, the, the, just the other day when I was uh, meeting with ministerial, our ministerial intern, Martha, that... Uh, we have been meeting mostly weekly for almost two years now. We meet to engage in conversations about her formation in ministry, and uh, she has been gracious to put up with many of my soliloquies about ministry and reflections upon uh, her experiences here. Those are soon coming to an end. And uh, I think about the ways in which those moments that we look forward to mark time. They mark time in our lives. Um, much like we do each week with touchstones, we have this opportunity in ritual to mark time, mark those joys and or sorrows in our lives by simply um, simply remembering, uh, remembering, looking forward to through this ritual of dropping a stone in a column of water. So if you'd like to participate this morning, just come forward, take a stone, two or more, uh, and drop the stones in the columns of water on the sides of the sanctuary. If you want to um, mark that in our Touchstones book, you may write, uh, write down your thoughts as well. So let us take some time to engage in this ritual together.
Martha will drop a few more touchstones for all of you who join us via live stream who have touchstones and for all those touchstones that we hold in our hearts and on our minds. My name is Martha Bogner. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and it is a blessing to serve as ministerial intern in this community. And I invite us now to enter into a time and a spirit of prayer as we read together the words of Reverend Dr. Kate Walker. And the response after each of the first few segments is on the screens, we pledge to transform our lives. For our Earth, our ancient mother, blue-green planet of the galaxy, harbinger of lives beyond measure, we honor you with our humble presence. We bow with humility and gratitude. We pledge to transform our lives. For the plants that have sustained our bodies, wheat, corn, peas, tomatoes, peppers, and soybeans. For the live species providing rich protein, fishes, poultry, pigs, and beef, we offer our thanks for the circle of life. We pledge to transform our lives. For the waters that give us daily life, from ocean depths to rocky cliffs, from Arctic ice to beaches and small streams, from lofty cloud to precious cup at our lips, we remember our dependence. We pledge to transform our lives. For the mountains rising to challenge our greatest aspirations, for the deserts transformed in a torrent of rain, for the forests thick with trunks marked by rings of wisdom, for roots interconnected web, for the new life within the heart of a seed, our souls respond in awe. We pledge to transform our lives. For the millions of species microscopic in the soils under our feet, to the pads, paws, and multi-toed, for the feathers and scales, for minuscule eyes open only under the moon's soft guidance, and for the lichens and mosses pushing onto the leaves and rocks, we honor your existence. We pledge to transform our lives. For all of us descendants of the first primates, for those who sleep under the same blessed skies, for those who breathe the same oxygen feeding our heart, for those who need love as much as I, and for those who yearn for the ease of compassion's release, we remember we are not alone. Called by love for the interconnected web of existence, I pledge to transform my life and yours. Amen.
part of belonging to a place is having a community to belong to. For many of us, broader society is not a place that we can usually be without having to layer up suits of armor and masks to be accepted or feel some semblance of safe. This is why it is important to have a place where we can bring all of us authentically. While our community could exist without a building, it's nice to have one and keep the lights on for those who have the which is why those who have the resources can contribute so that all of us have a warm place to come, take our coat off, and have a third place to belong to. If you'd like to help keep the doors open to all who come in love, you can give online at uulansing.org in the baskets that will be circulated in a moment as we speak, or by mail to the address on the screen. Any unspecified donations will go to the Reach Studio Art Center, which is an imaginative, vibrant, imaginative and vibrant space where all can make art and connect with their neighbors. We thank you for your generosity. I appreciated Alessandra's calling us into worship, reminding me of what it's like to come to a new place and how there's a evolution of that place becoming and feeling more like home these days. Um, when I go to a new place, I will often uh, be accompanied by an iPhone. Uh, and with that iPhone, um, I'll use the, um, the maps uh, on it and be able to find pretty interesting places via mapping. Um, it's kind of like when I first arrived uh, in Greater Lansing. I, would often use um, the GPS to find my way around. But at some point, I didn't need it any longer for most places. I had some familiar routes that I would take, and as those routes became more familiar, I became confident that eventually I would get to the places uh, that I, I wish to go. Now, once in a while, I'll pull out the GPS again if I'm unfamiliar with a place, but those, those routes that I take um, become more rote. Oh, isn't that interesting? Routes become more rote 
except for when in Michigan the summer comes along and they're no longer, those routes are no longer route. <laughs> Sometimes I get so far afield from where I expect it to be because each turn that I wish to take, there's another new construction site that prevents me from going on my way. So I am reminded in that moment that even as I become, uh, as I belong to a place, that place is continually changing as I am. This sense of interconnection and interdependence between place and between me. Some years ago, a ecologist and farmer by the name of Wes Jackson wrote a simple little book that he used as a lecture called, be, called Becoming Native to This Place. And in it, he, he kind of talks about this idea of a, a new farming economy, putting the culture back in agriculture, taking the business out of agribusiness, um, grounded in the principles of the natural world, um, trying to explode the tenets of industrial agriculture, um, he looked at sustainable practices and sought to integrate food production um, with nature in a way that would sustain both of them. He invited us to, um, like some folks who study something called permaculture, to really get to know the places that we are of before we change them. A, a, a way to sustainability um, that deepens our understanding of the place that we're in. So rather than just changing it for the sake of changing it, looking at that landscape over the seasons and over the years to understand where it might be um, that our humanness might fit into that natural world that is happening uh, all around us. I think in, in some ways it was about, gosh, four years ago now, time, uh, I don't know if you've had this experience since the pandemic of time kind of changing, maybe it's always changing, but my, my sense of of the amount of time that has passed uh, has changed. Maybe it's just uh, that I'm older. I'm not sure. Other people have talked to me about, yeah, the pan since the pandemic, I'm, I struggled to know, like, how long ago is that? Well, in April of 2020, that was four years ago, we were sort of just at the beginning of a, of a global pandemic. Um, I understand that about at that time, um, we, Let's see here, we had a, a large, <laughs> a large number of people in lockdown. Here it is. On April 5th, 2020, the peak of the pandemic lockdowns, 4.4 billion people, or 57% of the planet, were under some sort of movement restriction. At that moment, driving had decreased by more than 40% while air traffic had declined by 75%. And in those moments, uh, for some of us, we got to know our place a little bit more uh, as we were not traveling as much as we may have been in our homes and our yards, making meaning and witnessing to our lives. I learned a, a, fra uh, or a new word uh, this week as I was looking uh, into uh, this idea that we have that at the height of that pandemic, when human patterns changed, in fact, nature's patterns changed, and there may have been healing moments for it. Some scientists have call it, called it the anthropause. You heard this phrase, the an it was an anthropause. We all paused, but as I delved into it, of course, uh, my understanding, uh, my, my common sense, which told me, oh, well, everything got better. Well, that wasn't 
exactly the case. You know, that some things were better for some species and some things were worse for other species uh, during that uh, pandemic. Um, I found a New York Times article from about 2022 um, that started telling the story of uh, a place on the coast of Sweden uh, where human seabird watchers flock every year to witness to breeding seabirds. Well, the COVID-19 pandemic canceled that tourist season in 2020 and it reduced the human presence on the island by more than 90%. So with humans out of the picture on the island, the white-tailed eagles moved in and they were much more abundant than usual, researchers had found. Now, of course, you think, wow, fantastic, more birds in this place as nature recovers and people disappear from the landscape. But ecosystems are complex, and these numerous new eagles repeatedly soared past the cliffs where the protected population of common muirs laid their eggs. And as those eagles soared across those cliffs, they flushed the smaller birds off their ledges. And in the commotion that was created, some of the eggs tumbled from the cliffs, others were snatched by predators, while the mirrors were, were, were away, where they weren't normally away. And in that particular year, the mirror's breeding performance, a protected species, dropped by 26%. Some researchers said these birds were flying away out of panic and they lost their eggs. So great for one species, not so great for another. The complexity of this idea of the anthropos. Multiple studies also found that traffic had decreased significantly during those first moments, we heard about the decrease in car travel and air travel. And so wild animals found a new route uh, in their lives along roadways that were no longer full of motor vehicles zipping by. But eventually, guess what happened? The cars came back and the wildlife had found a new pattern and those Two things came to a collision, and we found that there were many more um, uh, incidences of roadkill uh, after the um, anthropause was over and what somebody called an anthropulse happened, uh, that we were all like, okay, we gotta, we gotta make up for our lost time in the, in the anthropulse. I love what um, Thich Nhat Hanh writes about this, this notion of the complexity, the both and of life. He, he writes it in a chapter of his book that is called a, The Heart of Understanding, and this chapter is called Roses and Garbage. Roses and Garbage. And Thich Nhat Hanh, the late Buddhist monk, writes, that, writes this, defiled or immaculate, dirty or pure, these are concepts we form in our mind. A beautiful rose we have cut just and placed in our vase is immaculate. It smells so good, so pure, so fresh. It supports the idea of immaculateness. The opposite is a garbage can. It smells horrible, at least mine, and it is filled with rotten things. Forgot to take it out. But that is only when you look on the surface. If you look more deeply, you will see that in just five or six days, the rose will become part of the garbage. You do not need to wait five days to see it. If you just look at the rose and you look deeply, you can see it now. And if you look into the garbage can, you can see that in a few months, its contents can be transformed into lovely vegetables and even a rose. 
If you were a good organic gardener and you have the eyes of a bodhisattva, looking at a rose, you can see the garbage, and looking at the garbage, you can see a rose. Roses and garbage inter are. Without a rose, we cannot have garbage. And without garbage, we cannot have a rose. They need each other very much. The rose and the garbage are equal. The garbage is just as precious as the rose. If we look deeply at the concept of defilement and immaculatelessness, we return to the notion of interbeing, the both and. In the Mahami Nikaya, there is a very short pas passage on how the world has come to be. It is very simple, very easy to understand, and yet very deep. This is because that is. This is not because that is not. This is like this because that is like that. This is the Buddhist teaching of Genesis. We look at this idea also of wealth and poverty. Thich Nhat Hanh talks about the affluent society and the society deprived of everything inter are. The wealth of one society is made of the poverty of the other. This is like this because that is like that. Wealth is made of non-wealth elements and poverty is made by non-poverty elements. It is exactly the same as with the sheet of paper. So we must be careful. We should not imprison ourselves in concept. The truth is everything. The truth is that everything is everything. We can only interbe. We cannot just be. And we are responsible for everything that happens around us. And then finally, sometimes we think some things are good and some things are evil, and then we discover the complexities of it all. Thich Nhat Hanh says that in the West, you have been struggling for many years with the problem of evil. How is it possible that evil should be there? It seems that it is difficult for the Western mind to understand. But in the light of non-duality, there is no problem. As soon as the idea of good is there, the idea of evil is there. Buddha needs Mara in order to reveal himself and vice versa. When you perceive reality in this way, you will not discriminate against the garbage for the sake of the rose. You will cherish both. You need both right and left in order to have a branch. Do not take sides. If you take sides, you are trying to eliminate half of reality, which is impossible. It is the both and of so much of my understanding of life. I have, be I suppose I've always been interested in fashion or, you know, the way in which I dress. And I was learning um, last week about this concept of fast fashion. Any of you heard of this phrase, fast fashion? Yeah, some, I see some heads nodding. Well, fast fashion is this idea that you can take what is on the runway uh, at the latest fashion show and put it into stores in a few weeks. It needs, fast fashion needs a lot of material, a lot of resources, and a lot of inexpensive labor and transportation to take those ideas from the runway and into the stores as quickly as possible. This fast fashion uh, is based on mostly on petroleum based fabrics uh, that uh, are quick to be made, not as many natural fabrics in what is called fast fashion. And then maybe what some of you have discovered is that in fast fashion, the clothing is not made as well, so it's disposable. I learned that every year there is around 100 billion pieces of clothing produced around the world, and 92 million tons end up in landfills. 11.3 million tons of fabrics in the U.S. alone as of 2018. 
The World Economic Forum suggests that fashion is the world's third largest polluter with global research suggesting the industry's annual greenhouse gas emissions range from, range from about 2% to 10% and they are growing. The speed of the fashion cycle is very closely aligned to the really key question in fashion and sustainability, which is around volume, says Kate Fletcher. She says, at the moment we're engaging in a cycle of gross overconsumption and gross overproduction, if you can slow the speed down, you can begin to reduce the overall volume and sense of that churn. Fast fashion, like I said, is made out of plastics. It's easy, cheap to manufacture, but it, when, when it comes time to dispose of those materials, it's difficult. It doesn't de degenerate into the soil. It's kind of like those fabrics are kind of like a trash bag because they're made of plastics. Well, I also learned that uh, recently that in response to this idea of fast fashion, slow fashion has come along. You may have found um, that, uh, well, I shouldn't say that, you may not have, I did, that there are many opportunities now to learn how to engage in slow fashion. Maybe some of you, did anybody bring knitting here this morning? Sometimes I see, there, yes, slow fashion. A knitter in the congregation. I, I can't think of, a, of, a, of a, 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 a more wonderful illustration of so slow fashion than knitting is. It takes time, and then you have this gorgeous um, garment, hopefully, not when I knit, but when others <laughs> knit, gorgeous uh, garments uh, that, that last, uh, made uh, with love. And now folks are beginning to do such things as mending again, mending clothes with different techniques and finding ways to make that mending artful. So they're making one of a kind pieces of clothing, attempting to rescue those fast fashions and bring them into a slower fashion that, that is more sustainable over the long run. It is a, a way of taking that both and uh, of life and slowing down. So if you're interested in uh, renewing some of your socks or your pants uh, or shirts or sweaters, there are people out there now who are prepared to share with you these wonderful uh, new tech, well, they're not new, old <laughs> techniques of, uh, of slowing down uh, that connection to, uh, to what we wear. I always seem to come back to this sense of the both and the holding it all uh, at once. And so with that, uh, we will go into our auction. Hopefully you can have some lunch with us uh, and in the days to come, we can think about how it is that um, we can continue to um, slow down in our fashion, in the other areas of our life. And hopefully that will be enough. So let us take the blue boat home uh, that will be on the screen soon. Are you going to lead us? Thank you.
I invite you to join with me in our benediction as a religious community inspired by awe and wonder we nurture spiritual growth connect in authentic loving relationships and engage in courageous work for peace and justice our worship is over may our service begin <laughs>